I am Molly White. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, by trade and by training, I guess. Um, I also am a researcher and a writer. Um, so I have fairly recently, I suppose, the past year or so, uh, gotten involved in researching cryptocurrencies, blockchains, uh, this thing called Web3, and all kinds of sort of related topics. And I run the website Web3 is going just great, uh, which is a somewhat sarcastically named website where I keep track of a lot of the things that are really just not living up to the promises in Web3 and crypto. Uh, so it has a lot of examples of scams and hacks and just bad ideas um, that people are coming up with that you know they think crypto and blockchains are going to solve. So before we get started, let's go ahead and do just like a quick overview of just like what those words mean, because it can be a little difficult if we're not all on the same page. Um, I'm not going to get super technical. I know this isn't like a CS course, and it honestly is actually not that important to know the, the super nitty gritty details of blockchains. Um, but what you do need to know is that they are basically a ledger, a database that records transactions kind of like this. So um, you can think of it almost as if like everyone had the record in their checkbook and it was all sort of together. So yours was recorded along with you know your neighbors and everyone else's and it was all in the same database and everyone could see it. Uh, so you could see, for example, in, in this example that Alice sends Bob five tokens, you know, that depends on the chain, what the actual token is called. And then maybe Bob sends Charlie two of those tokens, and then Alice is over there doing something herself. So, you know, it basically keeps records of these transactions. But unlike with, say, your bank or with some other system, there isn't one entity that's basically controlling this record. So instead of your bank having a bunch of servers that records your monetary transactions, this is all a database that is maintained by hundreds or thousands of different computers that are all sort of working together to keep this network uh, online. And that's a pretty difficult thing to do in computer science and just in the world, um, getting a bunch of people that you don't necessarily know or trust to all truthfully record the state of the system. And so you sort of get into this like game theory problem of like, okay, so we have all of these people who could all be bad actors. How do we convince them all to maintain this network and you know incentivize them against doing it? And all the solutions that have, uh, people have come up with that are being used today for these blockchain solutions all involve basically someone has to spend or risk some amount of money in some way and then in order or when they help help to maintain the chain, they earn some money. And so with Bitcoin, for example, which is one of the biggest cryptocurrencies, uh, people have to spend money in the form of paying for electricity and for uh, mining computers. And they are rewarded with Bitcoin when they maintain the network and they they rely or verifiably add blocks to the chain. There are other systems. So Ethereum just notably moved away from the system that Bitcoin was using. And they now have a system where people basically who have a certain amount of the token will stake that token and say, if I act badly, you know, if I do something that's not in accordance with the network, you can just take away all my money. And so they are incentivized to not do that because they're risking a lot of money and they can earn money for, again, maintaining the chain. So that's sort of the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, I referred a couple of times to cryptocurrency. What's that? <laughs> so Bitcoin, Ethereum, you've heard these words perhaps. Um, those are basically digital tokens that people believe is worth something. So it's not necessarily like other examples of currency uh, where, you know, the U.S. government is issuing it or any other state issues it. Uh, it's basically just an a online, you know, piece of data that people trade around. And if you have it, hopefully you can sell it to somebody else for around the same amount that you bought it or more or potentially less. Um, it's named a little bit poorly. It's not really a currency. The idea that a token that could be worth twice as much tomorrow or half as much tomorrow could actually function as a currency is, is pretty unusual. 
um, you know, people, there's a good example with Bitcoin where in 2010, someone spent 10,000 Bitcoins, which at the time was worth around $40 to buy two pizzas. And if he'd held on to those tokens, it could be worth $190 million today. At the all time high, it could have been worth more than half a billion. So if you think about, you know, US dollars, which is, you know, a traditional form of currency, if you had $10,000 or $40 in 2010, you know, there's inflation. If you still had that $40, it may not buy the same amount of pizza that it bought you in 2010. But it's like pretty close, right? Like it's not, it's not hundreds of millions of dollars different. And so, you know, the idea that this would function as currency is, is pretty flawed in the sense that currencies really just don't work very well when they're this volatile. So it's really more of something like an asset, like a stock maybe, or, you know, commodity. You know, people will argue over what it really is, if it's a security, a commodity. But it's something a little bit more like that, and you can think of it more along those lines. And so people will often buy and sell the cryptocurrency without necessarily getting involved in the mining, uh, just for the purposes of speculation. They hope that tomorrow Bitcoin's going to be worth more than it is today or in a year or in 10 years, whichever it might be. Um, and so they buy it and hold it for those purposes. And then uh, blockchains also serve some additional functions in addition to just recording those transactions that are like the number of tokens that went from person A to person B. So you can actually store data uh, using the same sort of systems that store those transactions. You may have heard of NFTs. This picture is a bored ape, which is one of the most popular NFT projects these days. Um, those are bought and sold in very much the same ways as tokens, uh, cryptocurrency tokens. There's also smart contracts. So basically people will add uh, code, they'll write programs, you know, upload them to the chain basically, and then people can interact with those programs uh, without necessarily having to like connect to your server or anything like that. So if you've heard of smart contracts or DeFi or any of these words around basically programs that are being built on the blockchain, that's what that refers to. Which then brings us to the idea of Web3, which is first and foremost a marketing term. Uh, I think that's important to remember. Uh, this slide here is from a State of Crypto report that was published by Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the biggest venture capital firms who think Web3 is just the bee's knees and everyone should be buying and selling crypto and you know creating these Web3 projects. Uh, it's a very effective marketing term. I will give them that. Um, you know, we the, it is based on the idea of Web One and Web Two, which are basically historical eras in the internet and in the web. Where you know we started with Web One. Most people who were using the web were just consuming information. You know, they might not have a website of their own, but they were reading other people's sites. It was very difficult to create a website of your own. You had to actually own the hardware to do it. You know, it's kind of a pain. Um, then there was Web 2, which is what sometimes people will refer to as today's internet. This was where more people were actually adding things to the web. So social media posts and blogs and, you know, whatever else, you know, sharing your photos, things like that. People were sort of writing to the web in more of a, a substantial way. But it's also the web where advertisers play a very big role. Online privacy is not... Uh, in a great state. I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, and so there's certainly flaws of it. And so people start talking about, okay, so what's the, what's the next one? What's Web3? And there have been a couple of different suggestions over the years for what Web3 might be in like the mid 2010s. Uh, some people thought it might be this like idea of the semantic web, which I'm not going to go too into in detail, but you know, there are basically other, uh, there were other suggestions for what Web3 might be. I would say crypto has been the most successful in getting people to believe that Web3 will be crypto and blockchains and all those kinds of things. But, you know, we are still operating in a web today that primarily is not using blockchains. And so it's mostly just this prediction that maybe it will in the future. And also, by the way, you should invest in these companies because this is the future of the web. Um, so that's kind of the, the goal around Web3. But Usually when people are referring to Web3, they're referring to web projects that use blockchains to some capacity. Uh, so it's not necessarily just like people trading Bitcoin 
that's not really a Web3 thing, but people who are actually building web projects that use these blockchains, you know, like NFT marketplaces or social networks that are powered by blockchains in some way, those, are ten those tend to be referred to as Web3. All right, now it's out of the way. We are all on the same page. <laughs> I hope you all understood that perfectly. Uh, so why? Like why blockchains, why crypto? What's the point of all of this? First of all, that's a really great question. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people were like, okay, Web3, like that's the next one. And you know, the number two goes to the number three. And so people have called it Web3. That's just gonna be the future of the web. But I think, you know, it's important to think about why do you actually need a blockchain, right? Like what does a blockchain do that software that we use today doesn't do? Um, there's some pros and cons. And, you know, I'm not a big crypto person, obviously. I'm a pretty strong critic of it. But, you know, there are things that it does that other software does not necessarily inherently do. The big two are censorship resistance. So if you are, um, you know, relying on a database that is uh, owned and controlled by your bank or your, you know, Facebook or by your government, for example, they have a lot of control over what you can and cannot do. And so a bank might be able to say, sorry, we're not going to serve you. You can't have a bank account with us because we don't like you for some reason. Your government might be able to say you're a dissident. And so we are not going to allow you to do whatever it is that you wanted to do. And Facebook can ban you. I mean, most people know this, you know, Facebook has the keys to the kingdom. And so they can say, sorry, we don't want you on our service for whatever reason, you're no longer welcome here. Uh, with crypto, that's not really the case. No one can say, hey, you, you can't use Ethereum or you can't use Bitcoin. And there are some ways that people try to enforce restrictions around, you know, sanctions on who can interact with various companies that are built on Bitcoin and Ethereum. But at the end of the day, anyone can read and write to the chain. Uh, it also provides pretty strong assurance that data wasn't changed or deleted. So with blockchains, you can only ever add to them. You can never actually delete a block from the chain. And once a block has been added, you can't change it. Uh, if you were to do so, or if you were to try to do so, it would become very apparent and, you know, the whole system basically breaks down. So you can pretty much rely on the fact that, you know, if, some, if there's a block that says that Alice sent Bob five tokens, she did that. Um, that's not necessarily true with, again, your bank or your government. You know, there's certainly regulations and laws and things that would, you know, certainly uh, discourage a bank from just forging transactions in their system, but they could technically do it if they wanted to do it. But then there's the question, all right, so what's the cons of crypto? You know, it sound, this sounds great, um, but when we're talking about technological solutions, we need to look at both sides of the, the coin. There's a pretty long list of cons when it comes to blockchains. Um, they're really slow. They're, they're really, really slow. Like uh, Bitcoin does, uh, I think it's seven transactions per second, which is nothing compared to like Visa or, you know, very similar uh, systems. Ethereum's a little faster, but not much. Um, and so when you're talking about, you know, using this at the web scale, you start to run into problems with speed. It's also very expensive. So not only is crypto, you know, the Bitcoin or Ethereum, you know, buying one or two of those can cost a lot of money, but in order to do anything on the blockchain, you know, just send money, you have to pay for the transaction costs and those can be very expensive and they certainly add up. It's difficult to scale uh, for the same reasons I mentioned. And it's also really difficult to use. Um, so if you are trying to keep control of your own tokens rather than use, you know, a, a centralized wallet provider like Coinbase or something like that. And all crypto people will tell you that you should hold your own crypto. It's the only way to do it. And it doesn't count if you're storing it with Coinbase. Uh, that's really hard to do. Uh, you have to basically become the security branch of a bank to do that. And even I, you know, a software engineer find it challenging. It's, it's difficult to do. There's a lot of risk if you have a lot of money stored that way. Um, and then privacy largely relies on pseudonymity. So I mentioned this earlier. Imagine if your checkbook 
uh, statement was basically on a public database. That's exactly what, I mean, that's literally true. You know, that everyone can see your transactions. They can see that you sent money to a different party. And so you basically have to rely on people not knowing what your wallet address is uh, in order to stay private, which is a lot more difficult to do in practice than it is in theory, I would say. Um, there's enormous exposure to price volatility. So if you are building software on something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, and then the Bitcoin price, or more like the Ethereum price, because Bitcoin is not really a software platform. If the Ethereum price doubles, then all that money that you were paying to do transactions and run your software also increases. Uh, and it's also very uh, prone to volatility based on usage. So the more people who are trying to do transactions on Ethereum at once, the more it costs to do a transaction. And there were some cases where transactions were costing hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars even, because of uh, congestion on the network. And finally, changing code and uh, patching bugs is really difficult. So I mentioned before that you can only ever add to the chain. You can't delete from it or change blocks. That includes code that is being run on the chain. So you can't actually go in and patch a bug if there's some flaw that allows people to just siphon all the money out of your project. You have to just release a new version of your project and then convince everyone to move over to it, uh, which is not the most uh, smooth experience, and it means that the money in your previous project is probably all gone by the time you get the chance to do that. Um, and all of these things have, uh, people have techniques that they have used to try to overcome them, but these are sort of the fundamental issues with the technology that then they sort of have to band-aid with other solutions uh, to try to surpass them. There are some claimed use cases for crypto, um, a whole lot of them, and I'm not gonna go through them one by one, but they say it's a store of value, it could be an alternative in you know, countries where the currency is enormously unstable, it could be used for remittances and cross-border transactions, you know, sending money back to your family in some other country. Uh, banking the unbanked is a really big one, saying you know, crypto will provide financial inclusion uh, moving away from the web's advertising model, provenance, decentralized governance, own your own data, real estate. I mean, people will say a whole bunch of things, often not a whole lot of details around how they will solve these problems, but there are a lot of problems that they claim to be able to solve. There are some more believable use cases, I would say. So the big one, and I mentioned this before, is censorship resistance. This is another slide from A16Z, Andreessen and Horowitz, that is, um, who are condemning big tech, which is a little bit ironic because they're a venture capitalist who funds a lot of big tech, including Facebook initiatives. So it's a little weird that they're calling them out on this slide, but who am I to judge? Uh, you know, they have big talk around how crypto will end digital authoritarianism and big tech oligopoly. And that's also uh, not really been the case in practice with their projects, which tend to centralize very much and is, again, enriching venture capitalists. But it is true that if you need censorship resistance from the state, from your bank, from your software provider, Cryptocurrency does at least try to achieve that. Uh, whether or not a given blockchain is actually censorship resistant or not is kind of a different question, but in theory, that's a possibility. Uh, and then another use case would be speculation. Um, so if you want to gamble on a crypto token, you know, you can definitely do that. Um, this is the Dogecoin chart. If you bought Dogecoin in February 2020 and held it and sold it in maybe April, you'd be doing pretty well. Some people did that and made a ton of money and then have to explain to their family how they made money on Dogecoin. But sure enough, uh, that is possible. Unfortunately, there's the other side of that, which is that if you read about all these people who made a ton of money on Dogecoin and decided to buy Dogecoin in April, you've probably not been doing so well since then. But uh, it is, you know, if you feel like to speculate on volatile assets, crypto might be for you. Uh, and then the biggest one, in my opinion, crypto is like catnip for venture capitalists. So if you are creating a startup and you need funding, just tell them you're going to use a blockchain and you are golden. Uh, that, I think, has been one of the biggest drivers of crypto and the Web3 phenomenon is that 
billions and billions of dollars are going into it from venture capital firms. I mean, it's just like shocking amounts of money. Um, so in my opinion, those are sort of the more uh, reliable, I guess, or, or believable use cases for crypto. But in my opinion, crypto and blockchains and Web3 is mostly a solution looking for a problem. So there's this saying that if you're a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Um, there's sort of a phenomenon in the tech world, especially in the past year or two, where people have basically been saying, all right, we need a blockchain. We're going to use a blockchain. What can we do with it? And so they start to sort of cast around and they say um, poverty or world hunger or cross-border transactions and remittances or social networks, you know, and they sort of start to try to look for something that a blockchain could potentially be applied to. It reminds me a lot of sort of maybe 10 years ago, my timeline is probably off, but when Uber was really getting big, and the big joke was everyone was trying to do Uber, but for something, you know, it was the gig economy boom. And so everyone was like Uber, but for your laundry or Uber, but for, uh, you know, taking care of your pet, you know, dog walking. And people were coming up with these startups and they were being hugely valued because they were kind of like Uber. And that's sort of what's happening today, except it's dog walking, but on the blockchain or uh, insurance, but on the blockchain. And so, you know, at best, a lot of them are just kind of silly. You know, it's like, why does a dog walker need a blockchain? Come on. You know, that just doesn't make sense. But some of them, I think, can do real harm, especially when you start to get into really serious issues like hunger, for example, or, you know, selling crop insurance to African farmers was a big one not too long ago. And there's actually real people at the other end of that who need food or they need you know, the, the assurances that they've been given around their crops. And if those projects fail or something goes really wrong, they can really end up at the, you know, getting the short end of the stick. Um, did I miss a slide? Nope. Uh, so this is a good, I think, illustration of some of the problems, quote unquote problems, that people are trying to solve with crypto for some reason. Uh, there's carbon offsets. There's uh, putting your DNA on the blockchain and then selling that, I guess. Uh, dating apps on the blockchain, social networks, Starbucks on the blockchain. You can get a NFT now if you are part of the loyalty program. You can get crypto just for walking around. I'm not really sure. I still haven't figured out what the business model is there, but um, that's a pretty cool one if you're the one walking around, I guess. NFTs for books and publishing. So this has sort of been the past couple of years, I guess, in the crypto world. And we've really run into something that is broadly known as the XY problem. So if any of you have ever used Stack Overflow, you might have run into this. But generally speaking, the idea is asking, how do I do Y, uh, which is, you know, how do I use a blockchain to solve world hunger, rather than how do I solve world hunger? And what's the way to do that? So people have basically been um, trying to find the solution rather than the problem. There's a good example of the XY problem where someone was receiving complaints around elevators. Uh, people were waiting around, the elevators were really slow, they were really bored and they were complaining about elevators. And so they started to figure out, OK, how can we make the elevator faster? But the real problem was that people were bored. And so what they ended up doing was installing mirrors in the lobby and people got to admire themselves in the mirror and give them something to look at. And the complaints went down dramatically and they didn't have to do anything to the elevators. There's another good example of this where if you go, you know, you're at a hotel, you're in a different country, and you go and ask, is there a convenience store nearby? They might just say no, and then you're kind of out of luck. Whereas if you say, if you look at the actual problem, which is I forgot to pack my toothbrush, you know, I, I need something uh, you know, simple like that, they can say, well, no, there's no convenience store, but there's a gift shop or there's a supermarket or there's something like that. And you'll actually have a better chance of solving your problem. This comes up a lot in crypto where people are saying, how can we use a blockchain to do X? When they're not asking, how can we do X? 
So a good example, uh, a good sort of uh, uh, philosophy for trying to solve problems like this is going, well, what's the actual problem you're trying to solve? Why does that problem exist in the first place? And then what solutions might address the actual issue and what are the trade-offs of those solutions? This is sort of the standard uh, model in software engineering, but I would say it's kind of the standard, mo standard model in most industries of trying to solve problems. And for some reason, it's sort of been turned on its head. I say for some reason, as though the enormous amount of venture capital funding isn't sort of the clear reason. Um, so we've seen this in reality a few times. For example, asking, how can we introduce Bitcoin to El Salvador? So if you ask that question, well, you can make it legal tender alongside the dollar, which is the current currency in, in El Salvador. You can have the government create a Bitcoin wallet app that everyone can easily download. You can give people $30 in Bitcoin if they download that app. And there you go. You've got Bitcoin in El Salvador. And that's exactly what they did. They weren't looking, in my opinion, at the actual question of, well, why do you need Bitcoin in El Salvador? What's the problem you're trying to solve? And one of the problems they're trying to solve is, well, it's expensive and slow to send remittances. And El Salvador gets 20% of its GDP via remittances, which is a huge amount. And so, you know, how can we make it easier for people to send remittances? And sure, you could say, well, Bitcoin, that's a solution. But you should also ask, well, what's the, what's the trade-offs of using Bitcoin? Now people are exposed to Bitcoin's volatility and risk. So when El Salvador rolled out uh, Bitcoin as legal tender, it was at $45,000. Now it's under $20,000. So anyone who decided to put money into Bitcoin at the advice of their president is down over half. Uh, people have to try to cash out this Bitcoin to spend it on food or rent or whatever it is that they're actually trying to use it for. People who are in the U.S., who are, you know, El Salvadorians in the U.S., who are, you know, they have unusual immigration status, they're not documented, they can't necessarily use it very easily because they need a bank account to do it. And that's a fair number of people. And Bitcoin is also slow and expensive, just like remittances, <laughs> uh, especially with the Chivo wallet, which is what's being used in El Salvador, which can you know, hold on to your Bitcoin for indeterminate amounts of time. And so they've sort of had this situation where they've tried to solve the problem Y rather than attacking the problem X. So why is, why is it slow to send remittances? Well, there's regulations there. You know, you have to make sure that you're not sending money to someone on a terrorist watch list, you know, that they're actually a real person. Uh, and there's, there's certainly serious issues with remittances. You know, there's bloat in the financial system. There are technological improvements that could be made to, to smooth that. There's smooth, you know, improvements in the regulations that could be made. But... Uh, you know, you do sort of need to consider those potential things before just saying, well, what about Bitcoin? So here's another good problem. People are asking, how do we make blockchains and crypto safer, easier to use, uh, less expensive to use, faster? When I think the real problem is that people are falling victim to these predatory schemes because venture capitalists and crypto evangelists are convincing them it's the future of the web, it's the future of finance, it is the solution to their, uh, you know, trying to create generational wealth and, you know, escape difficult inflation or, um, you know, earn returns on their investments that are not available to them in the traditional financial system. And if you look at problem two, my solution to that problem, at least, has been this website. Uh, Web3 is going just great. This is a project that I run. Um, and what it really does is basically it just keeps track of, well, how is Web3 going? How is this project that claims to be able to, uh, you know, revolutionize the web, increase equity to financial systems, um, you know, solve the issues of advertising and lack of privacy online. How's it going? Uh, and generally speaking, it hasn't been going so well. Um, there have been multitudes of examples where the security issues in, that are fairly inherent to blockchains and cryptocurrency have resulted in hacks of more than $100 million. These are all more than $100 million. Uh, and these are all in the past, 
I was going to say two years, but I think it's actually more like one year. The most, I think the earliest one is August 11th here. So just enormous, I mean, enormous amounts of money being stolen. Sometimes it's the venture capitalists who take the hit. More often, it's the people who are just putting money into these things as a retail investor. Um, and then there's other examples of things that are happening in Web3 as well, which are not necessarily the $100 million hacks, but it's sort of the rake thing, you know, that when someone steps on a rake. Uh, it's examples of basically just things happening that are so typical of crypto and Web3 and blockchain-based systems that you almost have to laugh at it. Uh, Bill Murray's NFT charity auction earned over $100,000, just amazing stuff. And before they could give it to the charity, it was stolen because his wallet got hacked. A crypto scam watchdog group that was trying to help identify other crypto projects that might be scams, they got scammed. They got exploited. Uh, that's the whole thing that they're trying to prevent. Someone, a developer, ran the wrong command. So instead of typing one thing, they typed the other thing, and they closed the project contract. And it meant that the 600 plus thousand dollars that were in that project, just gone. No one can get it. You can see it's there, but you can't get it anymore. And so there, everyone using that project is just out of luck. Someone tried to swap $5.00. And they ended up, it's like if you went to your bank and you put a $5 bill into the ATM and then the little screen said, all right, you've got $10 trillion in your bank account. Imagine if that happened. Needless to say, the user did not actually have $10 trillion. That would have like destabilized traditional finance if that kind of money was floating around. But it said they did. Um, a carbon offset company that was trying, you know, they're trying to help with the environmental situation, help people feel better about their environmental impact. They started a forest fire in Spain that ended up spanning over 35,000 acres. And it was the second one that they'd started that month. And then in November, Squid Game, huge TV show, everyone loved it. People were so excited about Squid Game that they bought into this big Squid Game token, which had no affiliation with the Netflix series, nothing to do with the original thing. And everyone involved in it just made off with $3 million because that was how excited people were to buy this new Squid Game token, hoping that it might be the next Dogecoin, the next Shiba Inu, the next Elon Musk token that would make them overnight trillionaires. So needless to say, I think that the, the uh, attempt to use technology to solve problems that in some cases are very serious and very real problems, you know, access to banking, uh, authoritarian governments, uh, you know, people being able to send money on the internet in a reasonable way. These are real problems, but saying, all right, we've got a blockchain, how can we solve them? has really not been going so well. And I think just to conclude, it's important to realize that there are basically never purely technological solutions to societal problems that crypto and other technologies are trying to solve. Um, sometimes technologies can be a part of the solution, but generally speaking, you can't just say, well, the financial system has problems, so we're going to make a whole new financial system. And oh, by the way, you can't change anything in it. And if someone steals your Bitcoin, they're gone forever. Uh, and expect that to just be a, a sudden improvement over the traditional financial system, which has years of development and regulation, for example, uh, baked into it. Yeah, so I think this chart here is maybe a good example of what tends to happen in crypto. So this is the Bitcoin price chart. Uh, since its inception, basically, you know, when it started, it was very, very small amounts of money. You know, Bitcoin was $10 or something like that early on. Uh, and then it had this big, big surge in like 2017. Um, you might remember there was a whole bunch of hype around ICOs, initial coin offerings, that instead of going public, every company was just going to release a token and it was going to be amazing. Uh, that got people pretty excited for a while. And then the SEC said, well, that's just a securities offering. And so things went back down a little bit. And then they sort of just, you know, uh, went along for a couple of years until 2020, which was 
NFTs and Web3 and all these new and exciting, uh, you know, potential uses for crypto. And, you know, we've hit sort of the, the hype uh, tops, you know, in 2020 and then again in 2021. And, you know, more recently, people have been less excited about NFTs and it's like, oh, the stupid apes, you know, there's sort of like less of a societal uh, willingness to accept those. Um, also, you know, with just the sort of traditional uh, financial system not doing as well, you know, stocks have been down. There's been less appetite for these crazy investments and, in, you know, walking your dog on the blockchain. Uh, so things like that have been down. But crypto... Um, and actually, I didn't point it out, but there were other sort of smaller hype cycles back in here that have sort of been blown out of the water by the more recent ones. Um, crypto just follows these sort of cyclical patterns uh, where people get really excited about something, you know, something sort of new comes along, whether it's NFTs or ICOs or Web3 or whatever it might be. Uh, people get crazy excited about it and then it just becomes unsustainable or something happens and it just crashes right back down again. I think we're kind of doomed to repeat that unless there is a significant regulatory change that would actually crack down on the fact that, hey, you know, these tokens look a lot like securities and you really actually have to comply with the traditional, you know, regulation uh, that securities have to go through which might sort of dampen some of the excitement around it and stop these crazy hype cycles from happening. But I think, you know, when people see the price crash like it has and they go, crypto is dead, you know, blockchains are dead, the hype is over. I think that's maybe a little too optimistic. I mean, some people would call it too cynical. I would call it too optimistic. Um, you know, people love to speculate on this stuff. They love to come up with new ways of using cryptocurrencies to sidestep securities regulations or, you know, um, the anti-money laundering laws is another big one that, that they sort of get, get around by using crypto. Um, you know, people will always come up with new ways of using it. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, it's likely that that will happen again. Please don't buy crypto based on that. That was not financial advice, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, one thing I will say is, you know, I I am not a big fan of crypto. Um, obviously, there that's not to say there have not been instances in which crypto has really helped some people. You know, so some people have become overnight millionaires, and that's great for them. Obviously, you know, they're they're not gonna uh, be upset about that. There have been instances where, you know, for example, there were large donations to Ukraine when the Russian Ukraine uh, invasion started. That's obviously, I think, only a good thing, regardless of whether or not they use Bitcoin or not to do it, or a million other cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, there are some examples where people have tried to flee authoritarian regimes and they put their money into Bitcoin and then they haven't had it confiscated at the border and, you know, all these different things. Generally speaking, my opinion on, on this is that crypto's best use cases are isolated, um, mostly because... You know, for example, if an entire, you know, a huge percentage of a country, for example, all started to try to, fl you know, flee an authoritarian regime using Bitcoin, that authoritarian regime would probably start paying attention and crack down on that the same way they do, you know, if you try to flee with a trunk full of diamonds or cash or gold or whatever else you might be doing. Uh, the problem is the authoritarian regime, right? And so you need to find solutions that fit the problem. Um... You know, is there something that outside of, you know, those examples of very severe circumstances where you need anything that's better than a really bad situation? You know, is there anything that I think crypto is particularly suited for? I think it works really well for people who are looking for speculative investments, you know, almost as a gambling tool. Um, obviously, the fact that, you know, Bitcoin generates the same or uses the same amount of electricity as like Finland or something like that is probably not great for something that is uh, just gambling. You know, imagine if Vegas used that kind of electricity. They've got a lot of lights and stuff, so I guess they probably do use, you know, a lot of electricity, but it's not like crypto. Um, but, you know, besides that, I think, you know, the, the actual requirements that are satisfied by a public blockchain. And that's what I'm talking about here is, is these public blockchains where anyone can read, anyone can write. Fairly few and far between. 
There are definitely circumstances where you want a database where you can, you know, it's append only and you can trust that it's never been changed in the past. So for example, if there was, if you are a bank and hackers got into your system and you want to look over logs of what was happening during that hack to figure out, you know, what they did, you want a system where you can trust that the logs weren't changed or that, you know, that bit right in the middle isn't gone. Um, but there are also a lot of ways of doing that that don't require a public blockchain. And so, you know, I think the number of problems that are really solved by a public blockchain are pretty minor, pretty minimal, yeah. Yeah, it's like you plant, or like I planted that question. Um, I, that's actually what I've been doing a lot of research into uh, more recently. So I am just a huge fan of the web. It's a weird thing to say. It's like, I love the internet. And it's, I really do. I think there's some amazing things that the web has enabled. Wikipedia being a good example. You know, I think everyone's used that. It's amazing that there's just this free repository of information out there that's fairly reliable, uh, that is just collaboratively created by a bunch of people who aren't paid to do it like that's that's wild I think if the whole web was like that that'd be amazing um so I yeah I love to think about like okay so how can the web be what we wanted it to be in the beginning you know when people first started to talk about the web it was this really utopian idea of you know everyone can talk to anyone halfway across the world you don't need to pay to talk on the phone you can just you know hook up your modem um you know you'll be able to meet all these people from different cultures and experiences and they'll get to share things with you you'll get to make friends you know you'll get to run your business with someone halfway around the world all this really cool stuff and the web absolutely has achieved some of that stuff it's you know the web is pretty awesome uh, for what it is today but there's also a lot of parts of it that are not great so for example the monopolization of the web by just a small handful of tech companies that's not great and one thing you might notice actually is is if you paid attention to web 3 you'll start to notice that a lot of the things that i'm saying are bad about the web are actually the same things that people in web 3 are saying are bad about the web we actually agree on a lot of the sort of problems uh, we disagree a lot on the solutions. So the monopolization of the web, that's a big one. The prevalence of advertising and sort of the advertising-based model that the web is built on, I think is pretty terrible, especially as you start to um, look into the invasions of privacy that are sort of happening around that. You know, you have to hand over a lot of data uh, sometimes by, you know, actually entering it into a form, but more often without really your knowledge that they're collecting that data. Um, so I think there's a lot of problems like that. Governance is another big problem of platforms online. So I mentioned Facebook banning you. The crypto solution is, well, we'll just create a, you know, a project where no one can be banned, right? Ethereum, you can't ban someone from using Ethereum. I don't know if that's really the direction that we should be going around. You know, when you look at online extremism, when you look at, uh, you know, you can, you can look at the really extreme examples like, you know, political extremism, child pornography, um, revenge pornography, uh, all those sort of really awful ideas of why you wouldn't necessarily want a truly free web where anyone can put anything they want. But you can also look at just sort of the really boring and mundane examples. Like, imagine if there was no spam filtering on the web, right? Like, anyone can post to the web. That means that, like, the people trying to sell you fake purses and, you know, those, like, weird scam replies you get on Twitter if you post anything about NFTs, that's just everywhere. Twitter can't do anything about that, you know? So there's, like, examples of stuff like that where it's like, oh, boy, I don't know about that. So as far as, like, what we could do to achieve uh, a more wonderful web uh i think it's a wonderful question it's one that i've been thinking about a lot um you know i think that reducing the monopolies would probably go a long way um so you know one of the reasons facebook sucks so bad is that there just aren't that many competitors to facebook and the reason that there aren't that many competitors is not because there aren't people who think they could do a better job or that could you know uh, make a, a social network that people actually want to use is because anytime someone tries to create one, 
Facebook buys them or they shut them down in some other way. And so they can't exist to compete with Facebook. And then you end up with these behemoths like Facebook and Google and Amazon and all these other big names that are incredibly difficult to compete with because they've become so big where, you know, if you're sitting in your dorm room dreaming up the next social network, you're like, boy, I don't know if I can compete with Facebook. So, you know, I think some uh, changes to the monopolization and, you know, actually allowing for proper competitive um, marketplaces online, basically, would be an improvement. Um, I also think that a lot of the best things in the web come about because people just have the time to do it. So, you know, one big problem with Wikipedia is, you know, I love to edit it. I spend my free time doing it. I think it's really wonderful and a great way to just sort of give back, but also to entertain myself. Um, and I'm able to do that because I have free time that I can spend doing things like that. But there are a lot of people out there who don't, you know, they work two jobs or they have a bunch of kids they need to take care of, or they have elderly family members that they're caring for, or for whatever reason, they just can't take the time to do those things that are really cool and really fun for them. Obviously not everyone in the world would go and edit Wikipedia if they had more free time, but you know, I think that everyone has something that they would do if they had that free time. And a lot of it is societally benef beneficial. And so if you look at crypto, the answer to that is, well, we'll just pay everyone to edit Wikipedia or play a video game or post on a social network. And that's the solution. But when you look at how that actually works out in practice, it also means that people have to hold the token. They have to pay to get the token. So now not only do you have to find the free time, you have to find the buying cost to do something like edit Wikipedia or play a video game. If you look at Axie Infinity, which was the biggest crypto blockchain game uh, until it was spectacularly hacked and you know things sort of fell apart then uh by north korea by the way uh the in order to start playing axie infinity you had to pay a couple hundred dollars to buy your little axie character which then you would sort of battle against other axes in sort of a pokemon way but like way less fun than pokemon has become or even started out being um and so imagine i mean Buying a $60 video game is already a lot for people, right? Like that's sort of the, that's what it costs to buy like an Xbox game when I was younger. I don't even know if it's true anymore. I feel like an old lady, I was like, what does a video game cost? Um, and if you're someone who is not in the US and you know, is not in a you know, developed country where salaries are fairly high, it's still $300. And that might be your weekly wage, you know, so the whole idea of like, well, we'll create this better internet by financializing everything, I think has a lot of problems. I'm a bit of a leftist, you know, my vision for the future of the web also involves a future of society where people are able to have time that is not purely spent earning money. Um, and so I think things like universal basic income could go a long way towards creating a web that, you know, I, that I think would be really great. Um, or just, you know, improving societal safety nets, you know, so that people aren't having to rely on a job for their health insurance or whatever it might be. Um, you know, I think it's kind of comes back around to the main point of this, which is that it's really hard to come up with a pu purely technological solution to a societal problem. And so in order to fix the web, I think we have to fix a lot of society, not just, you know, write the next best HTTP implementation or something like that. Yeah, I think a lot of what a lot of the talk around decentralization in crypto and Web3, uh, it often conflates decentralization of computing with decentralization of power. So if you look at Bitcoin or Ethereum, they're talking about, well, it's super decentralized because there are thousands of computers anywhere in the world that are all mining these coins. Well, validating stuff now. Ethereum recently changed its model. Um, and that's decentralized. But you could say that about Amazon Web Services, right? They have data centers all over the place and they're not normally considered decentralized because Amazon controls all the power. It's all just one company. The same is often true of a lot of crypto projects where the power is actually quite centralized despite the computing being decentralized. And so, yeah, I think that the idea that decentralization is somehow inherent to crypto or to Web3 is, is a very compelling uh, sort of misdirection.
Yeah, so the project is called Web3 is Going Just Great. Uh, you can find it on the web. It's web3isgoinggreat.com. Free to uh, take a look at if you like. Basically, any variation on the name will get you there, actually. Just, you know, sometimes it has the just, sometimes it doesn't. You can, you can just put it in. It's also on Twitter if you happen to use Twitter. So Web3 is great on Twitter. I mean, I think my ideal scenario would be that more software engineers realize that. Um, I think there is this really strong techno-utopian uh, view among software engineers that we are the, you know, God's gift to this world and we can write software to do just anything, which you know, we can write some pretty cool software, don't get me wrong, but I don't think we're going to fix all ills in society with software. Um, and it would be really cool, I think, if more software engineers would both acknowledge that and then actually become involved in the societal problems that do really need fixing. Um, you know, like I said, technological solutions are probably never going to be the solution to a societal problem, but they can definitely be a part of it. Uh, and so, you know, I think that there are all kinds of, you know, public good software projects that are out there. Uh, you know, focusing on those, I think, is... Uh, always going to be a good thing. Um, but, you know, I would like to think that in the future, software engineers might be taken down just a peg or two around their uh, sort of belief in society being uh, fixed by the programmers. I think a lot of industries fall victim to that. You know, there are writers who think that their ideas are going to be the best you know, solution to all of the world's problems. Politicians, for sure. You know, <laughs> so everyone, I think, is uh is prone to it